Yeah, it's pretty dismal. Um, I mean, the other big thing, of course, going on is the, you know, the, the aftermath of last week, the synagogue shooting, and before that, the would-be mail bombings. You know, there's still that, of course, continues to play out. A little related to all this is the thing you pointed out about um, this uh, research by Tanya Luhrmann mm -hmm. showing that when people, you know, truly unequivocally crazy, well, I don't, I, I mean, <laughs> not to. Yeah, that's not the word. People diagnose with schizophrenia. You know, people argue whenever there's violence, it's the same thing with, with uh, you know, Islamist uh, extremist terrorists, right? That are they crazy or are they blah, blah, blah? Well, Tanya Lurin studied people who are, who are deemed insane, unequivocally, actual, actual schizophrenics who hear voices, right? right? And you said she discovered that, um, what, that in other, in societies like Ghana and India, the voices are less likely to counsel violence than in America? Here's the way I remember the, the research. She uh, studied people diagnosed with schizophrenia who hear voices in Ghana, India, and America. And in America, almost all of them, or maybe all of them, um, identify, couldn't identify the voices. It was just some voices they don't know. And they mostly yell at them and say, you're worthless. And uh, I, I'm not sure about inciting violence, maybe self-harm mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's all very uh, negative. stressful, negative, and you're just being yelled. There's some quote from one of the participants of the study. I think it's some like never ending warfare of everybody against everybody. You're just in, in the middle of this battle within your head. And then in India, I think people are more likely to maybe recognize like a dead relative or something. And even if not that, uh, mm -hmm. voices just might be nicer, softer. They might say something entertaining. They might mm -hmm. give you advice. And in Ghana, I think people are more likely to hear God. And the conclusion from that is kind of self-evident. Like when you, I, I really love that study because it's very kind of simple and, and, and makes a point that should be obvious, but is, is not, which is the way a disease like schizophrenia uh, uh, manifests itself does have a connection to the environment that you live in. Does mm -hmm. does have a connection with the culture that you're in. Right. And there are, you can't easily, you know, say what the cause of that is. There are many the way mental health is treated in in different countries, whether it's seen as a disease or a, maybe you're talking to spirits because there are spirits, right, in a more traditional mm -hmm. society. And all that, but I gotta say, when reading that, after having been to America, it made total sense that in America, people diagnosed with schizophrenia are being yelled at by people they don't know who tell them they're worthless. And, and, and so, elaborate on that. From your point of view, it made sense in what in what way? It it would seem that if you are in any way you know, out of luck in America, whether you have mental issues or you're just poor or something, it's really stressful. Mm -hmm. the, the, the very, uh, there's just like the vibe of the society that, that you gotta strive for, for the better, you gotta compete, you gotta, you gotta maintain your whatever status or, or position in society or people are afraid about, you know, healthcare, Every, just there's this constant hum of life that everything might go wrong and you might fuck up and it's going to be over. Yeah. So if you're by disposition more sensitive to this kind of thing, you have, you know, the, there are peculiarities of your psyche that makes you more vulnerable to these kind of things. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it's not obvious that that kind of, dynamic, the kind of self-criticism and self-loathing dynamic played a role in either of these two kind of hate crimes. Sure. But mm -hmm. it, separate from that, it's a fact that in America, this seems to be one of the main therapeutic needs. I mean, if you, if you go to like, you know, meditation halls and so on, you will hear teachers emphasizing like, you know, 
Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't listen to that voice in you that's telling you to be hard on yourself. And, and I think they're emphasizing that because there's a perceived need. They're not mm-hmm. finding it in Buddhist scripture, by the way. If you go back into the ancient scripture looking for, for the Buddha to say, don't be hard on yourself, you'll find that you're more likely to hear him saying, be hard on yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. like, you know, stick with the program and, and you know, <laughs> be a better Buddhist or whatever. Um, I mean, that's not the way it would be put, but, um, but, but this is, and, and so that tells me that there is, um, you know, there is that need. Uh, and I don't, and of course there is the view, especially kind of among conservatives, like this is just people like whining, uh, you know, and don't, we shouldn't worry so much about nourishing self-esteem and so on. So there's an argument about it, but, uh, a lot of people are feel that they are painfully hard on themselves or, or painfully riddled by self-doubt or remorse or whatever. And so the big question for me in this, well, one of the big questions in, in, in this whole, uh, uh, you know, crux of topics is like when you have, whether it's political, like in this case, or you have, you know, your school shootings, uh, people talk about the gun problem. People talk about the, we have a mental health problem disguised as the gun problem. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's another layer to that, which is uh, a problem of culture generally, like these people who are unstable, who might go, uh, you know, over the edge and, and go and shoot everybody, they are sort of, they, they can be seen as a symptom of the society's problems. And I think like, so that, that kind of research that uh, Tanya Lurman did, showing that there's a connection between culture and how uh, a certain disease manifests itself, to me, the conclusion from that is, that means that the rest of society, the people who, are not plagued by uh, these mental issues, bear a certain responsibility uh, before people who are vulnerable to these things. You mean for creating the culture that... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all create this culture together, collectively. And if culture makes some of its participants, it doesn't make them crazy, but it, it, it makes a certain kind of mental issue, a real problem, where in a different culture, it might not be a problem at all. In fact, you might be like in Ghana, some of these people who would be, uh, you know, just a mental health patient in America, they become like shamans. And that's, there's like a place in the society for that kind of uh, person. In fact, there's an argument that's, that original, that schizophrenia, there is a genetic tendency toward it floating around in the human gene pool because it was functional right. in some sense in an environment of the kind in which, um, you know, in like a hunter gather environment or, or whatever. And that the more, you know, high tech and industrialized the society gets the further away you're getting from the environment in which it played out in a more benign way. So yeah, so that is like one of these questions that I don't know if there's any kind of answer to, but I think that are important to talk about, which is, do we have a responsibility? And if so, what do we do with it? Like what are the, I guess it just, I think it should be kept, you know, in the background of our minds of whether you, if you work in the media, you definitely should be aware that some of the people who are watching your CNN show or whatever, certainly some of the people who listen to Alex Jones might have, you know, might take your talk about, I don't know, lizard people in case of Alex Jones very mm-hmm. seriously and, and take action. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the, the argument for that kind of self-awareness goes further. I mean, I think it's, it's not crazy to suspect that, um, You know, if you ask, I mean, it is famously said to be the case that a lot of Trump supporters feel that people like me and liberals hold them in contempt, right? And 
it's not crazy to think that that is part of what feeds a psychology that in the most extreme cases with the most unstable people makes it more likely that they're going to go off the deep end. They've got yeah. this idea that there's this whole tribe that hates them. Naturally, that's going to support the idea that, uh, you know, I mean, if you're unstable to begin with, that har there's nothing wrong with harming these people who hate you unfairly. So uh, I think people who are fueling the fire from our side by casually suggesting that all Trump supporters are racists or all Trump supporters are stupid or most are racist or most are stupid or whatever. Uh, you know, again, I'm not getting into the question of moral responsibility. I'm not saying, no, the killer's not responsible. I'm just suggesting that if you try to figure out what various things contributed to this, whether or not we are morally responsible for having contributed in the past, we owe it to society and ourselves to try to avoid doing things that might be intensifying the fire. And it is, it, it is, it is a fire that's being fed from both sides to some extent. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, but human psychology is such that it's very hard to kind of convey that without people saying, oh, so you're saying we're to blame and not them? You know? Yeah, um, well, I mean, this brings me back to my, the point that I keep making every time. I don't think this whole division into two teams is working very well. <laughs> no, I, I think we can, you know, we have to be on a conference call in 30 seconds. I think we can end on uh, agreement that yeah. This whole division into two teams is not working very well.